you very much for uh, for this invitation. Probably I can use the mouse as a pointer. Thank you very much for uh, for this invitation. It's really a pleasure for me to be here in uh, Zurich. Uh, actually, I come to Zurich so many times, and uh, uh, today is a really beautiful day, a sunny day, beautiful weather. Uh, usually, I find rainy and uh, <coughs> foggy, but today is really like more or less in central Italy. Well, actually, I come from northern Italy, which is not very different from here. So, uh, so again, thank you very much um, um, for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, uh, the placebo effect and the nocebo effect. And uh, actually, what I would like to do today is to give you a very general, uh, very general overview uh, of uh, uh, both placebos and uh, nocebos, uh, and particularly why I would like uh, to make you understand why uh, the study of the placebo effect and nocebo effect is a very good model to understand uh, uh, the doctor-patient relationship. Uh, basically, I'm a neuroscientist, uh, both a basic and a clinical neuroscientist, uh, but uh, uh, I, I, can, uh, I can say that we use uh, the placebo response and the nocebo response to understand how our brain works. So uh, as a neuroscientist, I am pretty much interested in the neurobiological mechanism, the psychobiological mechanism, the psychological mechanism of the placebo response. Uh, well, today, you can see from the title that today we can talk actually about a f real pharmacology, a real toxicology. A pharmacology is a placebo effect, a toxicology is a nocebo effect, and we can talk about pharmacology and toxicology of words and rituals, which is pretty important in uh, medical practice and uh, in uh, psychotherapy as well. And uh, you will see, and I would like to convince you today that uh, uh, the emerging concept today is that drugs on the one hand and words on the other use the very same biochemical pathways. So just let me start. Uh, I have plenty of time, actually, more or less uh, one hour, probably a bit less than, uh, than one hour. But uh, I would like uh, uh, to start with uh, the overview of my talk. You see that the, my talk is uh, divided into different parts. The first part is uh, about the very definition of drugs, definition of a placebo. Uh, I would like to start from the definition uh, of drug. You will see that will help us. It's not very difficult to define a drug after all, uh, but uh, it helps us to understand uh, what placebo is exactly. Uh, and why it is important in, uh, when we study the doctor-patient relationship. Uh, then the second part uh, is uh, the neurobiological, particularly the, the, the neurobiological part or psychobiological part of my talk, because you see that what is emerging today, is there are many similarities between drugs and placebos. They use the very same biochemical pathways. When you induce positive expectations, when you induce negative expectations in your patients, actually you can activate or de deactivate, you can modulate different biochemical pathways which are modulated by the drugs we give in routine medical practice. So I, I, I would like to give you two or three examples. The first example is about the opioid system, the endocannabinoid system. The second example is about cyclooxygenase. You know, the cyclooxygenase is the main target of uh, uh, non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs like, uh, like aspirin. And um, uh, uh, the last example is about dopamine, Parkinson's disease. Just to show you that pain is not a special case. Parkinson is an important uh, a medical condition. Uh, it, it is a, an excellent model to understand the neurobiological mechanism of the interaction between the social interaction between doctors and, uh, and patients uh, and the placebo, the placebo response. Of course, there are uh, many similarities, but there are many differences. This is not surprising at all. There are many differences between drugs and, uh, and uh, placebos. Then a few words about the nocebo response. Why a few words? Because unfortunately, for ethical limitation, uh, uh, for ethical limitations, we know uh, much less about the nocebo response. Because in nocebo response, you have to induce negative expectations in the patient or in a subject, in a healthy volunteer, and so this is quite unethical in many, in many conditions, in many experimental conditions. So we know much less for ethical constraints. Um, then uh, why some people, this is, uh, I would say, this is a future challenge for placebo research, why some people respond, some other people do not. Uh, 
we are beginning to understand some of the mechanisms why some people are very good responders, very good placebo responders. Other people are very poor or, or, or they uh, don't respond to, placebo, to placebos at all. And then the emerging model, uh, some clinical implications. Actually, there are many clinical implications, but I would like to give you and to draw your attention on a single medical implication, on a single clinical implication, which I think within this context is quite important. <coughs> and uh, the emerging model you will see at the very end, uh, the, the very end of, uh, of my talk. So let me start with the definition of drug, definition of placebo. Um, uh, this is uh, sometimes a quite uh, difficult uh, uh, definition, you know, there is a lot of confusion, there is a lot of misconception about uh, these words, placebo, placebo effect, placebo response. So what do we study exactly when we study the placebo effect? So let me start with the definition of drug. Um, if we ask the question, what is a drug? Uh, the definition is not very difficult because a drug is uh, a molecule. We inject uh, a molecule into the body of the patient and this molecule is capable of modulating different biochemical pathways. For example, you see here a few examples, the muopia receptors, narcotic drugs bind to muopia receptors, uh, uh, cannabinoids binds to these receptors, the CB1 receptors, uh, aspirin, for example, or other non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs modulate the activity of this enzyme, which is uh, uh, cyclooxygenase, COX, uh, so this is a very, very simple definition of drug. A drug is a molecule, you inject the molecule into the body and you can modulate different biochemical pathways, different receptoral pathways. So if we change the question and we ask what is a placebo, the definition is uh, a bit more uh, difficult. It is a bit more difficult because the most common definition of, uh, of a placebo is that a placebo is a fake drug or a fake therapy, a fake treatment. Uh, this is true, this is correct, but the definition is not complete because something very important is missing. The correct definition of a placebo is that uh, the placebo is uh, the fake drug and the psychosocial contest around the therapy, around the patient. For example, you see the site of uh, the hospital environment, doctors, health professionals, uh, the smell uh, of drugs is important as well, words by health professionals, of course, needless to say, they are very, very important to be touched by different machines, for example, an ultrasound machine could be very, very important. Why? are these stimuli important? Because they represent sensory stimuli and social stimuli. We tell the patients uh, that there is a treatment uh, in progress, uh, which means that they tell the patients that uh, there will be in the next few minutes, in the next few hours, an improvement, a clinical improvement or a therapeutic benefit. In a single sentence or in a single, in a few words, I mean, we can call all these sensory and social stimuli the ritual of the therapeutic act. You know, there are many therapeutic rituals, actually. Uh, it is not necessary, but I show you a few examples of many rituals in uh, conventional medicine. For example, the ritual of taking a pill, the ritual of a shot, the ritual of surgery. Surgery has a very, very powerful psychological effect on the patient. Uh, the ritual of uh, uh, CAM therapies like acupuncture. Acu acupuncture is a very complex ritual uh, which induces positive expectations in the patient. The ritual of psychotherapy, the ritual of, uh, the ritual of medical devices, and why not the ritual of shamans? The shamanic rituals sometimes, unfortunately, are not very different from the ritual of conventional medicine. <coughs> That's true. I don't know, unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know <coughs> which words to use. Um, well, today I would like to show you, and actually this is the emerging concept today, is that all these rituals, all these sensory and social stimuli modulate the very same biochemical pathways which are modulated by drugs we give in routine medical practice. For example, if you take morphine as an example, uh, morphine bind, binds to the mu opioid receptors, but expectations about receiving morphine, uh, the psychological component, 
modulate the very same myopia receptors. And this is not different from uh, the target of aspirin. Aspirin modulates the activity of uh, cyclooxygenase, but uh, expectations about receiving aspirin modulate the very same uh, enzyme, the very same cyclooxygenase uh, uh, enzyme, and overall the cyclooxygenase pathway. So um, let me show you an example in the visual system, because the context is very, very important. Just let me back uh, one slide. The context, uh, all this context is very, very important. And our brain can be deceived by the context. I mean, it's very tricky. The situation is very tricky, because the context can change our perception completely. This is true for any sensory system, like the visual system. This is true in medical practice. I will show you in a while. But just let me start with an example in the visual system, just to show you that your perception can change completely if you consider the context around a couple of stimuli, and if you consider the very same stimuli, but without the context. You see here, for example, there is a chessboard, and this chessboard, of course, like any chessboard, has a white and black squares. Now, you see, the black square is A, the white square is B, but are you sure that this is the black one and this is the white one? Well, if I eliminate the context around uh, square A and square B, you can see that actually there is no difference. <coughs> The, 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 uh, the gray uh, and uh, the color uh, is uh, pretty much the same, it's not different. So, without the context, these two stimuli are exactly the same. With the context, uh, they are, uh, with the context, they are uh, uh, completely different. They are perceived completely different. Just let me replace uh, these two, uh, I, I would like to uh, to uh, switch from the visual system uh, to the clinical context. In a clinical context, uh, it happens uh, pretty much the same situation. It's not different, it's quite surprising, but it's not different. If you replace these two stimuli, two visual stimuli, with two bottles, these two bottles contain tap water, they are not different. Uh, there is tap water here inside this bottle, there is tap water inside this bottle, so they are pretty much the same as the visual stimuli. No difference between uh, square A and square B, no difference between bottle uh, A and bottle B. But I can change the meaning of these two bottles, uh, I can change the meaning of this tap water in different contexts. I can put this water, this bottle, in a context, and I can put this bottle in a completely different context. For example, the first bottle, I put this bottle in uh, an empathic context, you know, where there is a very good uh, doctor-patient relationship, but I can put the very same bottle in a different context, which is uh, uh, the opposite situation. I think uh, nobody would like to have a prescription uh, by a doctor like this one, you know, but you see that the context is completely different. Positive context and empathic context, and in this case, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, uh, the opposite situation, a negative context inducing negative expectations. So in this case, the context induces positive expectations. In this context, the context induces negative expectations. It's pretty much the same as the visual stimuli. Two, uh, uh, two, um, uh, visual stimuli, which are pretty much the same, they are not different. Uh, I mean, can uh, be perceived completely different from, uh, from uh, a visual point of view in a, in, uh, in, uh, if there is the appropriate context, you know? <coughs> so, uh, what is emerging today is that uh, these two different contexts can modulate the very same biochemical pathways uh, which are modulated by, by the drugs we give in routine, uh, in routine medical practice. Uh, let me uh, show you, let me uh, go into some uh, details. There is plenty of time, actually. Uh, you know that uh, discovery about in the 70s, a bit uh, before the 70s, but uh, mainly in the 70s, uh, 71, 72, 73, 
there was the discovery of the opioid receptors in the brain, the central nervous system. Uh, now, these opioid receptors can be modulated and can be activated by different stimuli. For example, they can be activated by agonists. For example, they can be activated by drugs. We give a routine medical practice like narcotic drugs, like morphine and morphine-like morphine pharmacological agents. But they can be modulated by social interaction as well. They can be modulated by words, by rituals, by behaviors, attitudes of doctors, and more in general, health professionals. So uh, these opioid receptors uh, are in our brain, and so they are activated by a variety of, uh, of uh, 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 behavior, by a, var a variety of rituals uh, in the clinical, in the medical setting. So, for example, uh, during evolution, uh, there was uh, an increase in the, in the, in the uh, expression of these opioid receptors. For example, we know today, and I would like to show you in the, in the next few minutes, uh, that the words by doctors uh, can uh, activate or can modulate uh, the biochemical pathways, the mu receptor biochemical pathways uh, in the patient's brain. But if you go back in... Uh, during, during evolution, you go back in time, it's not different to the relationship between the shaman and the patient. I mean, it's not very different. The modern doctor, the relationship between the modern doctor and, uh, and the patient and the shaman and, uh, and uh, uh, his uh, patient. If we uh, go back in time further, uh, uh, it's not really surprising that actually during evolution there was uh, the emergence of what we call uh, compassion, uh, altruism, which was very, very important in uh, the emergence of medical care, taking care of the sick, of the, you know, of the, of the patient who need to be uh, helped for some situation, you know, for the disease, for example, because he or she is suffering. If we go back in time, uh, you see that social grooming was really very, very important in the emergence. So there is a sort of a continuum uh, during evolution, uh, and you see here, during evolution, there was a sort of a continuum from social grooming uh, to the emergence of altruism uh, to the relationship between shamans and, uh, and patients uh, to the relationship of modern doctors uh, and, uh, and their patients. So there was uh, the emergence of what we call a pro-social uh, uh, behavior, which is aimed, of course, at helping the sick. So in this uh, relationship, uh, these are very important, uh, very important uh, uh, social interactions. Of course, uh, uh, many molecules have emerged during, uh, during, uh, during evolutions. For example, uh, uh, the expression of opioid receptor, the expression of, uh, of uh, 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 cannabinoid receptors, and so, and so uh, forth. So we can talk today about uh, a real pharmacology, a real toxicology of, uh, of words, of rituals, because uh, uh, we know that these uh, biochemical pathways, uh, these receptors can be modulated by social interaction uh, here to the right and by drugs here to, uh, to the left. This is the merging concept. Uh, I would like to show you two or three examples, probably more, three or four examples, to show you that in different medical conditions, actually, it, there is a, there is a, a similarity of the action uh, uh, between uh, drugs on the one hand and social interaction on the other. <coughs> so a placebo and nocebo is a very good model. It is an excellent model to understand this interaction because you give a placebo, actually you, you, you modulate the context, you modulate the, the psychosocial context, you induce uh, positive expectations if you give a placebo, you induce negative expectations if you give a nocebo, so you can see what is going on in the patient's brain when you induce either positive or negative, uh, negative expectations. So another point in uh, the definition, uh, which is very important, is that actually there is not a single, uh, there is not a single placebo response. Actually, there are many placebo responses across different therapeutic interventions, across different medical conditions. And uh, usually people ask me, what is the, 
which is the mechanism of the placebo response, this is the wrong question. The correct question would be, what are the mechanisms, the plural, what are the mechanisms of different placebo responses across different systems, across different medical conditions? You see, for example, that we know pretty much about, uh, about pain, about Parkinson's disease, and actually today I would like to show you a couple of examples uh, in the field of pain and in the field of motor disorders like Parkinson's disease, but we know something uh, about the mechanism of the placebo response uh, in some neuropsychiatric disorders like depression, anxiety. We know something about the immune system, the endocrine system, of course I have no time to talk about all these uh, <coughs> medical conditions. So I would like to start with pain just to show you that uh, drugs on the one hand and placebos, which means the psychosocial context, which means words, the doctor's words, use the very same biochemical pathways uh, and uh, th you can get the very same effect sometimes by using placebos and by using, by using drugs. You will see that there are many differences. Of course, this is not surprising. <clears throat> I, I, I will return on this point uh, later on. Let me start with pain, and I would like to start with uh, uh, by showing uh, you uh, a, a very good placebo responder. Unfortunately, not all patients respond like this one. Uh, we don't know why exactly. Uh, this is a challenge for future research. You see here, this patient underwent thoracic surgery for uh, uh, lung cancer. Uh, this is a surgical wound. Uh, which is pretty painful. So if you ask these patients to perform the full range of movement, you see that not surprisingly, there is a limitation of the range of movement because the surgical wound is painful. Now, if you give a placebo, which means you give a glass of fresh water or you give a sugar pill, but what matters is what you tell the patients. You tell the patients, I'm going to give you a powerful painkiller, but actually you give fresh water. And you ask these, these patients to perform exactly the same movement, uh, and you see that uh, actually now it is possible to perform the full range of movement. Well, the problem is that uh, you did not inject any drug, actually. You only injected the words, you know? So for a neuroscientist like me, uh, uh, the main question is, uh, why is there any uh, analgesic effect in this patient? We did not inject any drug. Uh, we only induced positive uh, verbal, uh, uh, verbal suggestions, which induced positive expectations. And so the main question is, uh, what is going on in the brain of, uh, of, uh, of these patients? <coughs> well, I would like to start with uh, the opioid system and the endocannabinoid system. Uh, for example, we know the, uh, for the opioid system, we know that narcotic drugs bind to the opioid receptors, but today we know that placebos activate the very same opioid receptors. We know that uh, some uh, uh, cannabinoid agonists like tetrahydrocannabinol here binds to the CB1 cannabinoid receptors, but today we know that uh, placebos actually activate the very same CB1 uh, cannabinoid uh, uh, receptors. <coughs> this is, uh, this is uh, 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 reconstruction, 3D uh, reconstruction of the brain of patients like, uh, like uh, the previous one. Just to show you, this is an animation, just to show you what is going on in the brain of these subjects. When you give a placebo, you will see that some uh, uh, brain regions light up. There is an activation of these regions. Some other regions uh, are deactivated in blue are uh, uh, inhibited by uh, placebo administration. So if we, give, uh, if we give a placebo, you see that there is an activation of different regions at the level of, uh, uh, of the cortex and at the uh, subcortical level. And uh, after a while, uh, you see that many brain regions are uh, uh, deactivated. These regions, uh, I, I don't want to go into detail, but these uh, regions correspond to, uh, to what we call the neuro matrix, which correspond to uh, the brain regions uh, uh, that are involved in, uh, in um, uh, pain processing. So it is not surprising that uh, there is a, a decree, a reduction in, uh, in uh, pain perception. You see, there is a deactivation of many regions which are involved in, uh, in pain processing. 
Uh, from a pharmacological point of view, this is an inhibitory system, which is quite interesting uh, from a pharmacological point of view, because uh, it can use this system, can use two different neurotransmitters. It very much depends on the previous exposure to different uh, drugs, to different pharmacological, uh, uh, different pharmacological agents. For example, if these patients were exposed to uh, agonists of the mopiol receptors, like narcotic drugs, like morphine, when you give a placebo, after exposure to morphine uh, for several days in a row, you know, then you replace morphine with a placebo. A placebo is a sort of a switch which turns on a memory mechanism for the activation of the very same opioid receptors. But if there was a previous exposure to uh, CB1 cannabinoid receptors agonist, <coughs> when you give a placebo, placebo is again a sort of switch which turns on a memory mechanism for the activation of the CB1 cannabinoid receptors. So you see that a complex mental activity like expectation, expectation is a very complex mental activity, expectation of therapeutic benefit, expectation of, uh, of clinical improvement, can use two different neurotransmitters, but it can, uh, it can, uh, uh, it, it uh, very much depends on, uh, on uh, the previous experience with different classes of pharmacological agents, different drugs. <coughs> Uh, a second example for pain is cyclooxygenase pathways. Today we know that uh, non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs inhibit uh, cyclooxygenase, but uh, today we know that placebos can modulate, can inhibit COX, can inhibit the cyclooxygenase pathway. Uh, just to show a very quick, very quick example, a very quick example, this is a very complex story, but ju very, very quickly in uh, a few minutes, this is uh, the uh, cyclooxygenase pathway. Uh, for example, there is an activation of this uh, cyclooxygenase pathway during a typical uh, headache attack. There is an activation of the cyclooxygenase pathway, an activation of uh, some prostaglandins like uh, PG2, and PG2 induces vasodilation in the brain, and vasodilation is responsible for the headache attack. So this is what, happen, what happens during a headache attack. There is an increase of PGD2, uh, PGE2, PGF2, and so forth. Now, if you give aspirin, uh, if you give aspirin, aspirin is pretty effective in reducing headache, in treating a uh, headache. If you give aspirin, there is a reduction in uh, PG, in prostaglandins, which means there is a reduction of cyclooxygenase activity. And at the same time, there is a clinical improvement. There is a reduction of the headache attack. But if you give a placebo, you see that a placebo uses the very same mechanism. There is a reduction of PGE2, a reduction of PGF2, PGI2. And at the same time, there is a clinical effect, which is a reduction of the headache attack. The effect is much smaller. Aspirin is much stronger. This is not surprising, of course, but the psychological effect, you can see, use the very same mechanism, an inhibition of cyclooxygenase activity, which means an inhibition of the products of cyclooxygenase activity, for example, PGE2, PGF2. Uh, the last example is about uh, Parkinson's disease, just to show you that pain is not, uh, is not a special case. Uh, uh, motor disorders are quite interesting from a neurobiological, a psychobiological point of view because uh, you see here again the story is not, is not different at all. Anti-Parkinson dopaminergic drugs bind to uh, the dopamine receptors but today we know that placebos activate the very same uh, dopamine receptors. Just let me show you here uh, a patient, this is a video, very, very short video, about a patient just before placebo administration and right after placebo, <coughs> placebo administration. This patient belongs to a clinical trial, to the placebo group, he doesn't know, of course, he belongs to the placebo group, and in this case we measure uh, bradykinesia, we, I'm sorry, <coughs> 
We measure bradykinesia, which means that uh, movements slow down. And you see that uh, the movements are very, very slow <coughs> from a starting point to uh, a target point. This is uh, a movement analyzer. And uh, the computer can measure the velocity of movement, the time from the starting point to the target, to the target light. So you see that uh, this is just before placebo administration. The movements are very, very slow. And then these patients will receive uh, a placebo, along with verbal suggestions that it is uh, a, a powerful anti-Parkinson drug, of course. <clears throat> this should be the last trial. Okay, this should be the last one. Now this one should be the last one. <coughs> now, it's going to receive a, a placebo, and uh, these are the measurements by, by the computer, different velocities of, uh, of movements, and uh, you will see what happens to the velocity of movement right after placebo administration. You see that there is a huge difference between, uh, between uh, the uh, pre-placebo condition and the post-placebo condition. This is a typical placebo response in Parkinson's disease. <coughs> Unfortunately, this response lasts very, is short-lasting, it's very short. In uh, our experience, for example, it's not uh, longer than uh, uh, 20, 25 minutes, uh, sometimes half an hour, 30 minutes. Uh, uh, the effect of a real anti-Parkinson drug is much longer, of course. So there is, there is a difference. I will return on this point, a difference between placebos and drugs. <coughs> so again, the question is, uh, what is going on in the brain of this patient? Why is there any... Uh, 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 effect on motor performance after placebo administration. We did not inject any drug, we only injected the words. So uh, this is what happens in uh, Parkinson's disease. This is a PET study, and the PET study, uh, I don't want to go into the uh, methodology of uh, raclopride and PET technique, just to show you that uh, uh, raclopride is a, a radio tracer there is uh, a binding, these red spots represent the raclopride binding, the radio tracer binding, just before placebo administration, right after placebo administration. Decreasing ra in uh, radio tracer binding means that there is a release in endogenous dopamine. <coughs> so when you, when you induce positive expectations, in uh, Parkinson patients, uh, you can induce uh, a huge release uh, in extracellular dopamine in the brain of Parkinson patients. Probably you are much more interested in comparison between the effect of a drug, a real anti-Parkinson drug, and the placebo, which means the effect, the pharmacological effect, and the psychological effect. This is the comparison. There is a 200% increase when you give a placebo, which means when you give a positive verbal suggestions <coughs> of uh, improvement in motor performance, there is an improvement, uh, there is a, an increase uh, of 200% in extracellular dopamine uh, of Parkinson patients, which correspond to a full dose of amphetamine, which means that a full dose of amphetamine uh, and a placebo uh, pretty much the very same effect. If you increase the pharmacological dose, of course, the pharmacological effect is much larger than the psychological effect. But for a single dose of amphetamine, there is no difference between what you tell a patient and, uh, and uh, the, uh, the effect, the pharmacological effect of amphetamine. This has a very powerful effect on uh, very powerful effect on uh, on uh, the activity of different neurons uh, in uh, in uh, the brain, uh, particularly in the basal ganglia. Here we implant electrodes in the Turin. We implant electrodes for deep brain stimulation, which is a pretty effective treatment for uh, Parkinson's disease. This is the electrode track. This is the electrode tip. We can record from single neurons uh, during. Uh, 
uh, the placebo response. Just, just as a very, very quick uh, example, I show you what happens at the level of a single neuron just before placebo administration and right after placebo administration. You see that the release of dopamine here can change the activity of different neurons in the basal ganglia of Parkinson patient. <coughs> this is a very high firing rate of neurons in uh, just before placebo administration. And this, you see here, there is a dramatic reduction of firing rate right after placebo, uh, placebo administration. <coughs> Uh, well, what about uh, the, uh, uh, probably I, I have, yeah, I have no time to discuss. Uh, let me say a few things about uh, the difference between, uh, between drugs uh, uh, and placebos, because of course it is not really, it is not really surprising that there are many similarities but there are many differences between drugs, between, uh, between uh, drugs and, uh, and placebos. And I would like to show you an example uh, for Parkinson's disease. This is a complex analysis. Uh, basically, from a clinical point of view, we measure the rigidity, the muscle rigidity at the wrist. And I would like to show you what happens in uh, 11 Parkinson patients after administration of uh, uh, an anti-Parkinson drug like apomorphine, apomorphine, which is different from morphine, apomorphine is a powerful anti-Parkinson agent. And what happens in 12 patients after placebo administration? So just to show you the difference between uh, the effect of a placebo and the effect of uh, a real anti-Parkinson drug. So this is what happens after administration of uh, two milligrams of apomorphine. This is the response of a single Parkinson patient. You see here that there is a decrease in muscle rigidity. This is a decrease by more or less 50% in muscle rigidity. And this improvement lasts more or less one hour or one hour and a half. Then there is a relapse of, uh, of the rigidity of the muscle. Okay? This for a single patient, you see what happens for uh, another 10 patients. <coughs> More or less, they respond to uh, apomorphine administration uh, with the exception of two patients. Here, these patients have a very small uh, response. These patients have a very, very small, uh, more, uh, small clinical response, you see? So, uh, nine very good responses to uh, apomorphine administration, two small uh, responses. Now, if we give a placebo, what is the difference between this kind of response after a, a, a drug administration and after, after a placebo administration? You see here, we give a placebo, and here the, you can see the responses uh, to placebo for these uh, 12 patients. Well, uh, you can appreciate that there are at least two differences. There are many differences, but I would like to draw your attention on uh, at, least, uh, <coughs> at least two differences. The first difference is uh, duration <coughs> of the effect. Apomorphine lasts, the effect of apomorphine uh, uh, is uh, uh, more or less long lasting. It lasts more or less one hour and a half, between one hour, one hour and a half. You, you see that uh, the effect of a placebo in this condition uh, is, uh, is short lasting. It lasts no longer than about uh, less than one hour, actually 45, 50, or uh, <coughs> 60 minutes, more or less. The second difference is the variability. Here, 50% of patients respond to placebo. You see that uh, six patients out of uh, 12 patients do not respond at all to placebo administration, but only six patients, 50% respond to a placebo. So these are the two main differences. First, there is a huge variability in response after placebo administration. And second, uh, as far as we know today, the duration of the placebo response is much shorter than the duration uh, to a real drug, to effective drugs. Of course, we are talking about effective drugs because there are many drugs which are not effective at all. <coughs> well, uh, something about a nocebo response. A nocebo response is the, goes in the opposite direction. Uh, you uh, need to induce negative expectation. This is the reason why we know very, very little about the mechanism 
of the of the nocebo response because uh, usually ethics committees uh, don't give uh, don't approve a protocol uh, in which you c induce uh, this is not surprising of course negative expectations in the patients you know <coughs> only in some conditions for example you can see here uh, the very same patient, uh, 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 she is a very good placebo responder, but she is also a very good nocebo responder. Now, we give the very same placebo, which means we give the very same glass of fresh water, but uh, along with negative verbal suggestions. We tell these patients, now I'm going to give you uh, uh, a powerful hyperalgesic drug, so there will be an increase in your pain in the next few minutes in the next few hours, okay? Uh, we ask these patients to repeat exactly the same movement, and you can see that there is a further limitation of the range of movement. This is what we call nocebo hyperalgesic response or nocebo hyperalgesia, uh, which is a psychological effect, which is due to uh, uh, negative, negative expectations. So again, what happens in the brain? What is going on in the brain of these patients? Why is there any hyperalgesic effect which is opposite to the placebo analgesic effect? Uh, again, this is a very complex story, but just to make a, a long story uh, short, uh, this is a brain imaging study uh, during a nocebo. Uh, hyperalgesic response. It is not very difficult to explain uh, from, a, from a, a mechanistic point of view the nocebo response uh, because uh, when you uh, uh, give negative verbal suggestions, you induce negative expectations and negative expectations activate the anxiety, anticipatory anxiety brain regions and anxiety, anticipatory anxiety <coughs> activates at least two different pathways. One is the CCK pathway. The second is the activation of, uh, again, a COX cyclooxygenase. So it's not really very, very, very difficult to explain the nocebo response. You induce negative expectations, and not surprisingly, you induce anticipatory anxiety. If I tell you now I'm going to induce pain on your... Uh, uh, a given part of the body, uh, of course, it is not really surprising that uh, your anticipatory anxiety regions in the, your brain light up or activated, you know. So anxiety induces an activation of uh, at least uh, two different uh, pathways as far as we know today, CCK and COX. For example, CCK has a facilitatory effect on, uh, on uh, pain transmission, and so you will experience more pain which is a psychological effect. So induction of negative expectation, induction of anticipatory anxiety. Anticipatory anxiety is related to the activation of CCK, and CCK has a facilitatory effect on pain, on pain transmission. You see, that's quite easy to explain nocebo response from a, a mechanistic point of view. <coughs> well. This question is a challenge for uh, future research. Why some people respond, uh, some other people do not? Uh, we don't know exactly why. This is very important, particularly in the clinical trial setting, uh, because drug companies would like to predict in advance who is a very good responder who is not, uh, just to eliminate a very good responder and to include in a clinical trial no responder. I, I don't think this is a correct, both from an ethical point of view and a methodological point of view, because this is not a real world. If you eliminate placebo responders and you include placebo uh, uh, no responders, uh, actually uh, it's quite, uh, it's quite uh, uh, <coughs> a problem from a methodological point of view. Well, anyway, drug companies are very much interested. They spend a lot of money to predict in advance who is a good placebo responder, who is not. Uh, well, we know uh, at least three, three mechanisms <coughs> uh, about placebo responsiveness. The first mechanism is learning. Learning, learning is very, very important. Which means that uh, if you give uh, if you give uh, 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 a placebo for the first time to naive uh, patients, 
Some people respond, some other people do not. I will show you an example. But if you give a, a placebo after repeated effective treatment, for example, if you give morphine on, uh, on Monday, you give morphine on Tuesday, and morphine on uh, Wednesday, morphine on Thursday, morphine on Friday, but on Saturday you replace morphine with a placebo, you can bet that virtually all patients will respond to a placebo. Which means that learning is very, very important. Just let me show you an example. In this case, we measure, for example, we measure pain tolerance. Uh, it's not important to discuss and to say what kind of uh, experimental pain. This is a kind of experimental pain. Just to show you very, very quickly <coughs> uh, uh, the, main, the main problem, the main problem of, uh, of learning. Um, on day one, you see here, on day one, this uh, 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 pain tolerance, which means that this kind of experimental pain is tolerated by these subjects for about 14-15 uh, minutes. Okay, so they return to the lab on the second day and we give a placebo and you see that there is a small increase in pain tolerance. Sometimes it is significant, sometimes it is not, but there is a small placebo response. This is a very small placebo effect. You give a placebo, you see there is a small increase in pain tolerance. Well, you can uh, increase dramatically this uh, effect by performing uh, uh, what we call a pharmacological preconditioning. As I told you before, morphine, 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 uh, and then you replace morphine with a placebo. So again, this uh, day one, the control condition, these subjects tolerate pain uh, about 14, 15 minutes. On day two, you give morphine, real morphine, not placebo morphine, and this is a typical analgesic response to morphine. You see that uh, there is an increase in pain tolerance up to more or less 22, 23 minutes. On day three, they return to the lab and you give morphine again. Again, this is a typical analgesic response to morphine. But on day four, you replace real morphine with fake morphine, with placebo morphine, but you tell the subject it is the very same drugs as the previous days. <coughs> and uh, this is what happens. You see there is a huge response. There is a huge placebo response. It is not as large as the, the response to morphine of the previous days, but you see that it is much larger than uh, <coughs> a, pr a first time administration of a placebo. So learning is really very, very important is uh, so important, uh, you can uh, 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 turn uh, placebo non-responders into placebo responder. <coughs> the second mechanism, uh, why there is uh, a difference between placebo non-responder and placebo uh, responder is genetics. There are many genetic variants, many, uh, uh, gene uh, genetic, uh, uh, many polymorphisms, uh, many genotypes, uh, which respond pretty well to placebo treatment. Other genotypes which d don't respond at all, actually. For example, a few examples, very quickly. We know something about uh, some neuropsychiatric disorders like social anxiety, like depression, like IBS, like pain. You see that these genotypes respond pretty well to placebo administration, um, administration, some other genotypes do not respond at all. We must be very, it is important to say, <coughs> it is important to stress that we must be very, very careful when we talk about the genetics of a placebo response because uh, we are at the very beginning. <coughs> we know very, very little. So these data need confirmation for sure. The third mechanism is personality. Personality traits, different personality traits are emerging as important mediators of placebo response. For example, that many correlations have been found between different personality traits and uh, placebo responsiveness. For example, optimists have been found to be very sensitive to placebos, pessimists to, to nocebos. This is not really uh, <coughs> a very, a very surprising. But uh, many personality traits have been found uh, 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 to be very well correlated with uh, the magnitude of, uh, of the placebo or the placebo response. <coughs> Well, the last part of my talk, I would like to draw your attention. There are many, many clinical implications. 
Uh, I would like to draw your attention on uh, a single, I think within this context, particularly in, uh, within this context, there is a, an important clinical implication. And this implication comes from um, and stems from uh, 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 the model which is emerging today. And the model which is emerging today is, as I told you just at the very beginning of my talk, is that drugs on the one hand and uh, placebos on the other use the very same biochemical pathways. They use the very same mechanism of action. So, for example, <coughs> you see that different rituals uh, and the psychosocial context around the patients uh, can activate different molecules in the brain, and these molecules bind to the, re to the very same receptors to which the drugs we give routine medical practice bind. So, for example, we, we have seen opioid, you know, uh, rituals of uh, morphine administration uh, activate the uh, more pure receptors, but narcotic drugs activate the very same more pure receptors. Or the ritual uh, of anti-Parkinson drug treatments activate dopamine, uh, but uh, anti-Parkinson drugs activate the very same D2, D3 dopamine receptor, uh, receptors. So just imagine a situation in which uh, <coughs> you give, uh, you give uh, a drug. For example, you give a narcotic drug. You give a narcotic drug, a narcotic drug like morphine binds to the more pure receptors, but expectation about receiving morphine, the psychological component, activates exactly the same more pure receptors. In other words, there is an interference between uh, what you expect and what you get. The psychological component can uh, uh, change or can interfere with the uh, action of drugs. So the last question I would like to <coughs> I would like to discuss, which is quite important, and it's important clinical implication, is what happens if we eliminate the psychosocial context uh, in uh, in this way, uh, which means uh, is the action of a drug like uh, a morphine, for example, is the action of a painkiller the same? without the ritual of its administration? How is it possible to, to, to eliminate the ritual of administration? Just let me show you a few examples. Uh, you see that we started in 1995. This is a routine, uh, routine medical practice. Routine medical practice, there is a patient, there is a doctor. The doctor gives a drug, for example, a painkiller. There is a complex uh, uh, context, some intravenous lines, some computers, you know. The doctor herself is a very important element of the psychosocial context, or probably the most important element of the psychosocial context. <coughs> so the main question is, uh, what happens if we give the same drug uh, at the same dose with the same infusion rate, I mean, nothing changes, but we give it in this condition. This is what we call, what we call uh, a hidden administration of a drug. Hidden administration of a drug, in a hidden administration of a drug, the crucial point is that these patients don't know that any drug is being given, so they don't have expectations. They don't have uh, the psychological component. So the main question is, uh, is the action of drugs the same without patient's expectations? <clears throat> just let me show, uh, well, again, this is, a very, this is a very long story, but just to cut a long story short, uh, I would like to show you what happens for uh, uh, four different, four different uh, uh, painkillers. In this condition, what we call an open injection of a painkiller and a hidden injection of a painkiller. The main difference is that in the open injection, uh, the doctor is giving the drug according to routine medical practice. In the hidden injection condition, it's not the doctor, it's not an health professional giving the injection, but it's a computer <coughs> performing the uh, injection. The crucial point here is that these patients do not know that any drug is being given, so they don't have expectations. They don't expect anything. <coughs> you will see a reduction in pain here. This is what happens. This is the difference for, for buprenorphine. You see this is an open administration according to routine medical practice. 
this is the hidden administration, same dose of buprenorphine by a computer. A hidden injection is less effective than uh, an open injection. And this is true for other painkillers as well. You see here for tramadol, for example, for uh, ketorolac, for metamizol, you know. For example, for metamizol, you see that there is a huge difference. <coughs> for cataract as well, for tramadol as well. Uh, but for metamizol, for example, you see, you see that uh, 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 metamizol is a virtually ineffective, a hidden injection of metamizol. An open injection is effective. <coughs> so this is quite interesting from uh, both a pharmacological and a psychological point of view because you can separate the pharmacological from the psychological component. The pharmacological component comes from the hidden administration because the hidden administration is free of any psychological contamination. The rest is a psychological effect. You see that in this case, metamizol, the, the, the pharmacological, the pharmacodynamic component of metamizol is very, very small. <coughs> Probably there is no pharmacodynamic component at all in this case. So it's only a psychological, a psychological effect. Just let me show you how we run a trial like this one because it is quite interesting. I have two or three minutes. Okay, yes, I have time for a couple, a couple more slides. <coughs> um, this is the question of this trial. Is metamizol effective uh, in this kind of post-operative pain? Uh, post thymectomy pain. You know that according to uh, classical clinical trial methodology, you have two, group of, two groups of patients. The first group would receive metamizol, the second group would receive uh, a placebo. Then you compare metamizol with a placebo. If a metamizol is better than a placebo, you, see, you say yes, metamizol is effective. This approach is completely different because you compare an open injection of metamizol with a hidden injection of metamizol. <coughs> there is a full informed consent because this is what you tell the patient. You will receive metamizol, but actually you don't know when metamizol is delivered by a computer. Uh, this is the, the, the trial. Very quickly, you will see the time course of pain in this condition, an open or expected injection of metamizol according to routine medical practice and a hidden injection of metamizol or unexpected injection of metamizol <coughs> performed by a computer. You see that, uh, you will see the time course. This is the pain intensity from 0 to 10. Uh, this is the duration of the trials, about 6 to 7 hours. Uh, we start, you see, from uh, a pain intensity of about 5. This is the timing of metamizol administration. You see that right after metamizol administration, there is a dramatic decrease in pain. Here there is no effect, no analgesic effect, but a computer is delivering metamizol here somewhere. We don't know. <coughs> we know only at the end of the trial. You see that there is a huge difference between the open injection and the hidden injection. Here there is a huge analgesic effect. Here there is no analgesic effect at all. So the crucial question at the very end of the trial, we asked the computer, when did you deliver metamizol? <coughs> this is the answer. You see that uh, there is uh, uh, no effect of metamizol, which means that this is not a pharmacological effect. Otherwise, there should be no difference between this condition and this condition, open and hidden. If metamizol were really effective, uh, we should see an effect here as well. Okay, so this is a psychological effect. It's not the effect of metamizol. This is a new way. This is a new way to run clinical trial. We can discuss it uh, in in uh, in the discussion. So the very end. This is my last slide. Um, the very end of my talk this is the model which is emerging today, different therapeutic rituals, the doctor-patient relationship, uh, placebos, words, different rituals uh, can use the very same biochemical pathways which are used by drugs we give in routine medical practice. Of course, the drugs are stronger, have stronger uh, effect, but uh, the uh, psychological component uh, 
the doctor-patient relationship, uh, placebo administration uh, use the very same receptors which are used by drugs with routine medical practice. So it is really very difficult sometimes to assess the, really the real uh, effectiveness uh, of a drug. So let me conclude with a sentence which I think is quite important within this context. Uh, you see here that Voltaire said, uh, this is more or less the take-home message, Doctors pull drugs of which they know little to cure diseases of which they know less into human beings of whom they know nothing. Thank you very much for listening. <clears throat>